court system for civil law cases. Okay, and we could have a special system for criminal law cases. Okay, um, take a look at the German model. That's pretty much how it works. Yeah, there's one appeal court for there's a special appeal court for admin law, a special appeal court for labor law. They only deal with these issues. And then only if you have a specific constitutional query in relation to fundamental rights can you go to the constitutional court. Yeah? Okay, so that's, and I think that's being proposed. Yeah? Um, but given the size of the jurisdiction, Okay. That means it's a lengthy, lengthy process to resolve civil cases. If we have ADR, ADR is pretty much natural justice. We do not require civil court to. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, informal legal systems. So you are coming to terms with the reality that there are multiple legal systems in India. I can be a panchayat, yeah, or. Uh, Okay, so what you are discussing now is the overall litigation crisis, yeah? That there are too many cases. Okay, so yeah, so you looked at the entire system now. Um, I'm more interested in the role of constitutional judicial review. How are you going to organize that? Are you going to get out of this context? Um, okay, so there has to be some sort of restraint for this apex court, right? It can't go on and take more and more special leave petition by itself and then complain, oh, I had too many cases. I think the model of constitutional court is applicable only to continental countries because they have a different judicial tradition. The doctor of state is ICA, is ICA Omnis. Mm, I think in comparative law nowadays, this distinction between common law and civil law, continental, it's sort of breaking down. Yeah? I would have big problems calling India just a common law country. It would be very... I would have problems with that. Maybe you end up, but you have up a whole debate what that actually means. Yeah? So I, I don't think that would be... I think you should be creative, right? You have to think out of the box. Hmm? I think one better option will be reducing the volume of constitution. Reducing the volume of constitution. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, Okay, okay, I'll put this down. New constitution. <laughs> Why are you laughing? How long do you think the Indian constitution is going to be around? Your grandkids? Yeah, I've told you the average lifetime of a constitution is 19 years. In Switzerland, they have a con new constitution all the time. It's not a badly governed country, right? You can. Why not? Yeah? And it's your country now, right? I mean, you are young. Make a constituent assembly. So, so I have a five-pointer program, which might be, in, I mean, I think if it's feasible enough, you can incorporate it. Firstly, I think there should be a system of screening of cases, especially with regard to PILs. Because, sir, right now, we, if you look at Indian there is a system of accepting PIs through letters as well, right, in India. So primarily I think that probably, I think we have to find out another mechanisms and not accept PIs through letters which is very rampantly used in India. So that's one, with regard to screening of cases. Secondly, sir, I think uh, this, is a, this is some sort of discussion which is still going on in the Supreme Court when I've attended a few proceedings there, that the judges believe that there is a voluminous amount of papers. So probably you should reduce that in, the t in terms of electronic filing as well. So making it an electronic procedure might be also with, have some sort of effect even on the environment and also with the way proceedings go on. So that might just improve the process. That's my second issue. Thirdly, sir, I think filling in the vacancies, because we have like 
quite hundred number of seats which are vacant in terms of judges, whether it's of the High Court as well as of the Supreme Court. So I think if you fill up the vacancies, that's going to reduce the burden on each of the judges. Because if you see the rosters, each of the judges are uh, given certain number of cases to be decided on a particular or hear the matters on a particular day. So once you have even, for instance, even if you fill up the vacancy to at least a substantial number, it's going to drastically reduce the number of uh, judgments which another judge is going to pronounce or hear a matter for that matter. So that is with regard to the third issue. Um, for me, sir, I do not know what's the status with regard to the National Court of Appeal, but I think that's also a good system. Because what they're planning right now is having a National Court of Appeal, which is like a circuit bench of the apex court in respect of other states. And those sort of matters which have an importance can be decided in that respective state, but that is going to be like the Supreme Court of that state. But that is exactly like a circuit bench of the apex court of our country. That will eventually have a lot of advantages as well as disadvantages as, as with a lot of other policies. Like for instance, it's going to reduce the amount of expenditure which um, a client needs to pay when they have to travel all the way to Delhi for that matter. And every person cannot afford to do that. And also with regard to the fact that not everyone can afford a, a Mr. Salvi or Mr. Mukul Hadgi for that matter, right? Because they're charging like some 5 to 7 lakhs per hearing. Um, so that's one. Uh, then, sir, lastly, I think um, this might sound a little stupid, but I do believe this is very important, that is reducing corruption. Because I think the reason for PI is coming into existence for a lot of issues which are extremely frivolous is because of corruption. Whether you see a lot of these coal scams and, and such sort of matters in our country, uh, a number of PIs come, uh, I mean, come about is because of the lack of implementation of the policy as well as the fact that there's so much corruption. So people believe that public interest is there at large and that's the reason they file PIs. So probably if you think if you can implement all of these policies together in an efficient, transparent method and mechanisms, I think this is going to probably reduce the number of cases. That's it. Yeah. All right. Um, can I just say something to that? Yeah? Hiya. Um. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, I just want to contradict the point that acceptance of the letters, because uh, only people who are not able to approach the court, they are uh, taking the uh, form of letters to I mean, uh, to address their issues. So, a uh, socially spirited letter, they are approaching the IS forum. So, I think that may be regulation or on terms in which the PALs can be made for. Among yourself. So I would like to uh, just that point at the lower level of the litigation. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Like in US, 90% of the cases are uh, solved outside the court you know, through negotiation and mediation. The thing in, uh, in India at present, advocates are there who uh, work as mediators. So I think there is a need to parallelly stand another community, like maybe teachers can be good mediators. So like another field of mediators. So like some educational institutions can be set up so, so as to produce mediators only. So their work will be specially mediation or negotiation or, or arbitration, not like litigation should be separated. Yep. Okay. Is there anybody else who really wants to raise them? Okay. Yeah. And then we'll close. So just one point, I don't say I might be wrong, but so in terms of PIL cases, I think the jurisdiction is with, re with regard to Article 32 and 226 only. Now, sir, I do not think a fundamental rights issue can be actually negotiated out of court at the first place. So I do not think ADR mechanism is going to be an apt mechanism in order to decide a fundamental rights issue, especially because the only mechanism in India we have is Article 32 and 226 for PIL jurisdiction. So probably we need to relook on that, but I think this is like not, might not work out in our country. Um, yeah. S sir, you are raising question to have a... Uh, you are raising question to have an organization of the court for constitutional review, am I right? Yes. So you need to have, a, instead of having a separate constitutional court, we can have a permanent constitution bench in the existing Supreme Court. It is feasible, I think so. Okay. Because it requires a constitutional amendment. It is not, it's, it's not easy for, okay. as of now. Yes. That's my opinion. 
absolutely fine. Yeah? So you raised the practicality and implementation of the reforms. Um, yeah, whereas the others are just thinking brainstorm style. Yeah, they don't just wild out there. If I may add upon uh, having a bench, uh, the problem is that, say, imagine for a hearing, a three-judge bench gets together for a hearing of a matter. Uh, there are cases where the three-judge bench has uh, gathered again after three years to hear the next hearing. So for a constitutional matter, it might take years for different hearings. And I also feel there is an under-preparation of the advocates because uh, when they appear in constitutional courts, and uh, one more is uh, they add upon a lot of cases which has no substantial value of law because I've heard bail cases for whether the uh, lawyer negotiating whether it's a 10 lakh or 15 lakh in the Supreme Court. I think it shouldn't be entertained in the first place. And second, uh, I, I do concur with uh, adding computers and uh, having uh, e-resources in the, the Supreme Court. And in regard to, uh, we should also consider having judicial evaluation standards for the judges, uh, you know, so they can perform better and who can perform. There's one judge who is, uh, I think he's delivered 1.4 cases in his entire uh, duration in the Supreme Court as a Supreme Court judge. Uh, and uh, in regard to, uh, they should also consider having uh, strengthening of the lower judiciary and the high courts so the quality of judgments are better so people don't have to go to a Supreme Court to, you know, address their grievances. Okay. So. I have just one uh, not only of Nepal, but I don't know if it may be correct or not, uh, but rather than screening the cases and, and taking it to the court, what we can do is uh, 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 introduce the concept of a research uh, assistant. So every case that goes to the court will be first researched by research assistant and they will know the pros and cons of what the case is and what it can be done. So when it go to the judges, so they don't have to look it from different perspectives. So research assistant may help them on it. It may not be correct. Okay. Yeah. Two, two points. Uh, I would consider scrapping the holidays for the Supreme Court. Yeah, okay, no, no holidays for judges. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, one thing I'll have to circulate by because I can't uh, remember the name. There's an Israeli scholar who does absolutely fascinating work on the computerization of the Israeli judicial system. Yeah? That gives enormous amounts of power to the executive. Yeah, they have a special executive who's not part of the executive, but he's an administrator who now has enormous control over the judges. And don't forget with software, yeah, in Germany for decades, yeah, maybe even for 100 years, we know how many cases a judge has decided per day because they keep very good records. Now with a computer, you know when they log in, what they read, how long they read, which key like when, yeah, it's enormous amounts of control that you're given with a computer, especially in constitutional cases, um, it's not going to be easy. All in all, um, I think your answers were fantastic. I would encourage you um, to be even bolder, yeah, to fundamentally redesign the way you appeal, how cases stop in the states. Uh, I think your generation will face all these issues and uh, you're not going to solve it with uh, more efficiency. More efficiency will just mean more case law and more case law will just mean I can't read it anymore. I, I can't. Maybe you can. I can't. Yeah? Now, I wanted to end on a high note. Why do we compare? Um, there is a massive, a really huge research project in the European Union studying religious diversity and there's a whole section there that just studies the jurisprudence coming out of the Indian Supreme Court. Right? So one of the good things about comparison is um, uh, you know, just to realize how much the jurisprudence of your legal system is appreciated abroad. Yeah? and how much attention is being paid to that. Um, so why do we compare um, you know, could be policy to get ideas, to fill gaps, uh, evaluate what's worth of our own system, how can we improve it, and so on and so forth. But I think especially for comparative constitutional law, what you find in these courts at the moment is... Um, the meanings are not fixed, right? They're going forward and backwards in all sorts of directions, sometimes better, sometimes worse. 
But I think the deliberative process that is going on in constitutional courts articulates a vision for the world that really holds potential for progress. Yeah? So I'm not saying these courts are the progress, but I'm seeing a lot of potential for progress in this particular type of governmental institution. That's sort of my impression after studying these courts comparatively. And with that, I thank you for your patience, and I hope we can continue the discussion over lunch, and thank you once again so much. Thank you.